Good evening, welcome to tonight's Shia. Tonight is uh, today, it's a special day, the yard site of the Arizal, and the Rebbe encouraged the clown the nine days to add in Torah to fill in Stoka, Betzibur. So, whoever's down in Betzibur, I'm sure you've done that, that happened already, but uh, we'll be going, we're learning Torah Betzibur virtual Tzibur, and everyone's got a socket push card home. So we'll start off. I'm going to put a, something in Stocker, then I'm going to share with you something from the Arizal, okay? So if you have a push card, we're going to do it collectively. Now, okay, so a board of the Arizal before our list of questions. So this is in, I've taken it out of the Ein Yaakov, in Gemara Brochus. And then it, there it says the following Kol Hakriveya Mokhoim Lit Filosoi, Eleke Avrohom Be Ezroi. Whoever has a set place for davening, Hashem, the God of Avrohom will be at his aid, his assistance. So he quotes here this is Anaf Yosef, one of the commentaries on the Ein Yaakov. He quotes from a Sefer Derech Moshe how a person should have a set place for davening, evening and morning, because the Shechina, the Divine Presence, would be in the Shul, or in a place where there's a set place, if you are in a place where there's no Shul, so you have your set place for davening. And if someone will say, well, Hashem is all over. So the answer is, yes, so why is it important to have a set place? Whenever Hashem is there, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll pick up your tefillahs. So he gives the following um, explanation. You should know that nowadays, with our, unfortunately for our many sins, Eden are compared to a nido. As it says in the beginning of Echo, al le nido hoyoso. They're like a nido. And a nido is forbidden to sit with her husband on a bench which is not stable. If it's a, a, a bench which is nova nod, which will which will uh, shake, which will sway, so the husband and wife wouldn't be allowed to sit on that chair on that bench. Therefore, since Eden are compared now in the state of Nido, so the Shechina cannot reside with the Eden. Oh no! But if it's a mocking kavua, if it's like a fixed bench, then the Shechina can be together with the Eden. So this is a. Uh, I'm, Sounds, sounds like quite a, 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 a word, but it's, it's a, a word that he's saying in the name of the Arizal. And the uh, the posture thing is, why is it important to have a set place for davening, whether at home or in shul, is, I, I think, on a very simplistic level, that people might be distracted sometimes with the things which are going on around them. If you have a, you come to a new place, there's a new, there's a new environment, so things are, are distracting. After a couple of days, you get used to it. If you come every day to the same place, so then there's less distraction. You'll be able to just focus on your davening easier. So at any rate, so we have here, I've said before, the Rebbe encouraged to increase the union of tefillah um, with Sibur during, especially during the nine days. Um, so here, the idea of mocking kavul at tefillah was also related to en to enhance the union of tefillah. Let's go on to our questions, though, which we have listed here. So a couple, uh, so some shluchim are in a some remote place. At the moment, there is no mikvah there, and they received a grant from some fund to be able to build a mikveh there. At the moment, the mikveh is not up to operations. No, it's, it's, it's like in the future, but at the moment, it's not, they're not ready there yet. Okay, but the money is sitting in a bank, let's say. Meanwhile, they're, for their current expenses, they are struggling. And so their employer, in other words, there's like a head shliach of the area who's responsible for their salary and he doesn't have the funds to pay them and he at the moment so he says borrow from that from that uh, mikvah money 
So they asked, is that legitimate for borrowing that money, which was designated earmark, to donate for building a mikvah? Is it, is it legitimate to use it for other purposes as a loan? So not so explicit, but my impression is that no, it wouldn't be okay. You have here, I say for Soko Mishpat on the screen, he talks about money which was collected for a shul, for the building of a shul. And there's a wish to change it for a different use. And you'd have to have the Tuvi Ho'ir, the leadership, the lay leadership of the, of the community. And then they would be allowed to change it. Without that, you wouldn't be allowed to. Then he says to borrow that money and to put other money instead. That would it would be okay, but I think that that's that's true. Um, he means that to borrow that money to immediately replace. Well, I'm I'm very concerned here that they received a a grant for a mikvah, and if they're going to use that for current expenses, come the time when they'll want to build the mikvah, they will turn around. They won't have the funds. What I did say to them is they could use this money as as this the money in the bank, they could use it as a security, perhaps, to take a loan from the bank and, and against that money, which is um, which is the mikva fund. But to actually touch that money directly, I felt would not be uh, well, not be justified. Let's move on. Right. So. Some weeks ago, someone asked me to clarify what's the source of the minhag of touching the Sefer Torah at the beginning and the end of one's aliyah. So what we have, first of all, is Shulchan Aruch. Unfortunately, this part of Shulchan Aruch is not there in the altar of the Shulchan Aruch. It talks about the Sefer Torah looking opening the Sefer Torah before saying the bracha, to see the posse when you're going to start, and then you'd roll the Sefer Torah closed, and you'd say the bracha whilst the Sefer Torah is closed. That's how we know, not everyone, there are those who say the bracha with the Sefer Torah open. So that is the, that's the Shukhan Aruch of opening the Sefer Torah. Like when you make a bracha on anything else, you kind of, look at, you kind of hold it in your hand kind of thing, before you make a bracha, it's kind of focus, this is what I'm going to make the bracha on. So you're going to make a bracha on a part of the Kriya, of the Torah, so you, you look at what you're going to say, you're going to be you're reading. So that's just looking. Then we have here, the next quote is from a Sefer Shari Ephraim, which is a uh, specialist Sefer on Kriya Satur. So he describes the person has a Leah, so he's the uh, whoever's in charge of Al is going to show him where they're going to read from, and then he writes, and it's customary that that the one who's having the aliyah touches with his talus or with the mantle of the sefer or the gartel nowadays, and touches al mixas part of the the column which is going to read, kisses the talus. And then he says, who minig was seeking? This is a, a time-honored minig. This is also confirmed, a little bit more detail, in Hayoim Yoim, as you see in Dalad Elul. One touches the talus, with the talus, at the beginning of the reading and at the end. So that's a bit more specific. The Shari Ephraim just said about touching the mixas or omud, some of the column. And here it's more pointed of touching the beginning at the and the end and then kissing that the talus where the talus touched the sivataira rolling it closed turning it to one side and then you make the bracha to, to tilt it to one side and then you open the sivataira and the reading commences the actually the rebbe certainly in the later years would touch at the beginning and the end and the beginning again and at the end of the aliyah, we touch at the end, the beginning, and the end again. Right, so that, that, that's a development from the uh, Shari Hafraim's Minag Vasikin. And 
this goes back to a sefer called the Alkut Hagir Shuni. Uh, that's this Yalkut Hagir Shuni. Okay, so let's let's just stop for a second. That there was a concern, there is a concern, and it's, I think it's worth discussing this. That sometimes people touch with the talus or with a gartel, and they wipe. It's got a swipe or, uh, with the gartel on the parchment with the writing. And I, it's, I cringe every time I see it because there is the, the concern that when the person is speaking, whether you said your brochus or whether the balkoira, it's very common when people are speaking, a bit of saliva comes out of their mouth accidentally. If there's a bit of saliva somewhere on the, on the script, on the on the and then you take a cloth and, and rub it you're going to cause a terrible smudge and it could, it could cost money to repair but it's going to be a violation of the of you know it's going to ruin the the, the, the writing and so it's something really so because of this concern so let's go on to the next slide the Yalkut Gershuni um not even sure when how far ago how long ago he lived he wrote but he writes by some Particularly, he quotes from a sefer that it's not right that people touch with the uh, cloth on the letters of the sefer Torah. It's likely they will come to erasing Hashem's name, erasing on Shabbos, because it's often that there will be some little bits of, of uh, saliva, and therefore one should announce that this is a minig. It's a minig shtus, and it's enough to just to see. Now, this position was also taken by the Munkacher. The Munkacher Rabbi says, don't touch the Sefer Torah, don't touch the writing, just, if you have to touch just the side, just the margin, don't touch the writing. Nevertheless, the Yalko Gershuni says, it, this is a widespread meaning, and it's done to, to show that how one cherishes the mitzvah, and one, and one, like you kiss your tzitzis. So it's also, this is a form of cherishing the mitzvah. And therefore, Anachalah Hem Yisrael, leave it and continue what they're doing, and therefore, one shouldn't stop this. And he, so he quotes now from the Sefer Yosef Oymetz, which is meaning of Mahogim of Frankfurt, going back about 300 years ago, to open the Sefer Torah and to honor it. Also, by a, with a kiss, as you take leave also. So this is an old meaning. Right, so... What, what, the, what should be said, though, very, clear, very clearly, that whilst we do touch the Sefer Torah with the cloth or with the talus, it's a touch and not a, not a wipe and not a swipe, because that chas v'shalom could cause damage. And so it's exactly the same for people who go for hagve. And they open it three, three columns or more. That's fine. But there's no need to pass the cloth all over and, and give it a big swipe over three pages, three columns. Just touch it. You've, you've, you've showed your respect, you're cherishing. That's wonderful. But avoid the swiping because it could be causing damage. So that's about the, the positive and the negative about the touching the sifatoria with the cloth. Let's move on. So I got a, a, a WhatsApp message earlier last week. Why don't we eat meat in the nine days? And if you're going to tell me it's because of Avelis, well, and, and during the week of Shiva, an Oval Rahman Litzlan is allowed to eat meat. And just to clarify, there are two stages. There's a stage called Aninus, which would be uh, intense grief. And during that time, that's until the Leviah of, that, of the, uh, the relative. So until the, the funeral takes place, they're not allowed to have wine or meat. Once the Leviah does take place, and they are allowed to. The Oval is allowed to have wine and meat. So therefore, why not during the nine days? Why can't you have meat during the nine days? What you have on the screen is from the Levush, which is uh, it's actually very common for the Levush to give explanations for minhogim, for uh, practices. And he writes, the reason for not having meat, this is in commemoration that the daily sacrifice in the Beis HaMikdosh was a lamb in the morning, lamb in the afternoon, that ceased at this time of Tisha B'Av, Shabbat etc. At this time, the Beis HaMikdosh ceased to function, and therefore one of the things which is 
uh, stopped was the Hashem's bread, so to speak, the daily Korban Tomit. And the Korban Tomit would be accompanied with pouring of wine on the Mizbeach. And for this reason, to kind of relate to the sadness of the fact that there's no Korban Tomit and no Nesochim, that's the reason for the Minig of not having <clears throat> meat or wine during the nine days, unless obviously in the case of a Sulas Mitzvah, if, uh, when it's justified. Okay, let's move on. So someone asked me last week a contemporary question that that's become a common thing that people take the broken glass from the chuppah, where the chosen treads on a uh, stamps on the glass and it breaks it, and they take this glass and they bring it to a uh, someone who's just uh, artisan or whatever, who would then melt it, melt that glass, and now create something very beautiful, candlesticks or something. I've even heard that it goes even further, that now you can buy special fancy glasses which are multicolored for under the chuppah so that they should be able to create a fancy piece of ornament from the broken glass. So the, the, the moral dilemma of this person was, is this out of place? Because here you're breaking the glass. One of the reasons is to commemorate the destruction of your shalai. So then you make this into a piece of jewelry and a piece of into an ornament to make something fancy. It seems a little bit incongruous. That's that was the I think they feel the sentiment to object. So there is a concept of taking a, a mit an article which was used for a mitzvah and to use it for another mitzvah. It may not necessarily apply here, but let's go through that. We have here in Altarevet Shechon Aruch, in Nechus Pesach, to take for the burning of the Chomets, to use the Arovas, which were beaten at Hoshanas and Hoshana Rabbe, and to take the Luluf, or the Arovas of the Luluf, rather, and to use them for the baking of Matzahs, which is an interesting um, observation, that the Hoshanas, as we know, is to, um, to, to sweeten Gevuras. It's got to do with Gevuras. And therefore, to use the Hishanas to burn the Chomets, which is more of a negative thing. The Arovis is a mitzvah, a positive mitzvah. And therefore, to use the Hishanas, sorry, the Arovis, to use them for the baking of matzah. So you have this idea of using something for a totally different purpose, but this was used for one mitzvah to use it for another mitzvah. The only thing is that there it's not that those mitzvahs are not destructive. Well, here there's a minyag of, the, of to destroy a glass. That's where the bit of the dilemma is. Okay. So then there's a famous Gemara. Yeah. So for one, let's go to the positive side of it. First of all, the fact that I did a bit of a Google search on this, and I saw this become really a very popular thing. Many, many sites are offering to make stuff, nice stuff for you from your uh, chasana, broken, from broken glass from the chasana. Just a minute, close the window. So actually, I saw this in a positive light. You've got these Eden who are not necessarily um, for keeping everything, every day, detail in Shulchan Aruch, but they are getting married in a kosher way. And this is part of the ceremony. And they're cherishing. They're making a celebration of part of the, of the chuppah, which I think is, is, is beautiful. But let's, say, let's take it further. You have a Gomorrah in Brochus who says the following, that one who benefits from the Suda of a Chosn, he doesn't gladden the heart of the Chosn, then he's in violation of Kol Sosn, Kol Simcha, etc. And if he does gladden the heart of the Chosn, so he says, what is the reward? So there's various rewards. First of all, about the five Kolas. Then he says, Rav Nachem Bameitzchuk says, one who gladdens the heart of the Chosn on the day of his wedding, so it's as if he built one of the ruins of Yerushalayim. Because it says, This is based on a Apostle in Yirmiya, talks about the sound of celebration. 
uh, of, of a wedding. And then it says, I will restore Shavus Ha'oretz, Kavari Shrein. I will restore the settlement of the land as, as it was at the beginning of our Hashem. So a chasana is, uh, is a kind of a rebuilding of Esam English. Therefore, I don't see it totally out of, out of uh, order to take something which was to commemorate the, the, the destruction and then to use it to make it something make something beautiful. And that's what our avoider is. We have the concept of Shvira Sakhalim. We have, there are ruins in this world. And our mission is to take all of those bits and pieces and to, 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 uh, to elevate, to perhaps fuse them together and to create some of the harmony and to make something beautiful. So I, I think there is, taking it a little bit further, I think there is actually a, a very positive uh, way of, of, of looking at this, of this minute. Let's move on to point number five. What is that? May one wash a shetel during the nine days. So this has been discussed in various contemporaries forum. We don't do laundry during the nine days. And that's really got to do with Hesach Hadas. Uh, anyway, we don't do laundry during the nine days. So what is a, what is a wig? A wig is, after all, it's, it's a garment. It's a garment made of hair, but it's basically a garment. So here we have a sefer called River Vais Ephraim, uh, from Ephraim Greenblatt, Greenblatt of Memphis, where he asked this question, he was, he was asked this question, and he had said it's okay. Since I've, but since then, I've seen in the uh, following sefer, Divrei Chachomim, the name of Rav Yashiv, that it's not okay. He considers it a beged. Whereas Reb Chaim Pinchas Schreinberg says it is okay because he doesn't see a wig as a beggar. What I've seen in other contemporaries for him, whether Shem Rav um, Vosner, etc., they say no, they say they see a, a shetel, they see a wig as a garment, and therefore it shouldn't be washed during the nine days. I had one uh, woman who contacted me and she's feeling very, very uncomfortable and it's going on holidays, whatever. And I felt that it was appropriate to rely on the, the lenient opinion. So generally, the answer would be no. But a push comes to shove, and sometimes you have to be accommodating where people are finding things very uh, taxing. So I said there are opinions who you can rely upon to, to uh, have your shetel washed. Let's move on. Seriously, I, have a, I haven't really found a solution to this problem. I'll tell you what the problem is. You have here, this, this is not in, in England, it's, uh, somewhere overseas, and there is available government aid to help families in need. So someone's working as an agent, finding helpers to go into families and to help them with the children and with, with the community, and you get, and people are paid for that. And so then we have the situation where some of their needs on Shabbos. Let's say it's a single mother and she has a boy of 10 years old, 12, 11 years old, and he never goes to Shul on Shabbos because he's uncomfortable to go alone. So then there's someone who's, a, who's ready to take this boy to Shul. It's, it's a couple of hours. So they, that would be it. Over here. And that's an amazing thing because he's going to give this, this boy positive attention. The boy will start enjoying going to show. And that's a wonderful thing. That would be a, a tremendous investment for the spiritual uh, welfare of that boy for the, for, the, for the years to come. Can they charge for their hours? So you're not allowed to charge for your hours and shops. So I'm going to read here. This is from Simon Sheenfall. And let me just clarify something. There's a difference between schar shabbos and um, and employing a, a goy on shabbos. You are allowed to have a goy work for you on shabbos. I'm talking about work as in a guard, I'm not talking about malacha, like a, a security guard, a waiter, a waitress. You can have goy working for you, and you can pay them for their shabbos time. That's not a problem. It's only that you can't pay them on Shabbos. I've discussed this a few times because even if you put an envelope at the side and say, just take the envelope before you go home, 
that wouldn't be okay uh, because you're basically it's paying people as the transaction shouldn't be done on Shabbos. But here we're talking about a Jew. A Jew is not allowed to earn money on Shabbos. It goes so far that if I would have money generating interest, if it would be earning money per hour, not per day, then I wouldn't be allowed to be earning interest on Shabbos. The fact is that the interest is charged from midnight to midnight, and therefore I'm not earning the interest on my savings on Shabbos because it's also that that unit in it, it straddles Shabbos and not Shabbos. But you're not allowed to earn money even if you're not doing anything. Certainly, if you're doing something, you're not allowed to charge and earn money for your Shabbos time. So then it has here in Shulchan Aruch and the Sin Shin Vol about hiring a chazan for Shabbos or Yom Tov. Even if the hiring was confirmed before Shabbos, they wouldn't be allowed to take payment for Shabbos and Yom Tov. So to the one who's blowing Shafar and Shoshana, there are those who permit this because since there's a mitzvah purpose, then Shachar Shabbos is waived. The issue of Shachar Shabbos is waived since there's a purpose of mitzvah. Shachar Shabbos, which you're going to be paid after Shabbos, is only a precaution because you shouldn't come to hire someone on Shabbos. And why aren't you allowed to hire someone on Shabbos? Because it's a, it's a, like an act of, of, of trade. And why aren't you allowed to trade on Shabbos? Because you might come to write. So it's a bit remote. So Indeed, the minig is to allow payment, paying a chazan of Altakea for their services rendered on Shabbos. However, he does continue to say, But one wouldn't see brocha from that from that payment, from that salary, even though it's permitted. There is a way of doing with the package. And so if you have a chazan who is employed by a shul and his duties include Shabbos and not Shabbos. So if there's a Levaya, he's on duty. And if it's on Shabbos and if it's a, a chasana, he's, he's, he's hired to provide chazonas services as and when they are called for. And then And there's a package. It's not paid per hour. That would be a, a, a way of getting around it. With a balkoire, the general approach is that he's paid for his preparation as well as his rendering of the reading. By the way, that means if he's prepared, being paid for his preparation, if he has to lay in two or three times the same kriya, he can't charge um, twice and three times as much because he's it's, it's being paid for the preparation. Be that as it may, the issue in our case is that since it's a government paid um, position of a government for a service, they need to give a, an invoice for their Shabbos time. And that's really where I'm getting a bit stuck. It's all very well, I could say, Mr. Kara, you'll, you'll do some work with this boy on a, a Tuesday or a Thursday, and you'll also take him to shul on Shabbos. And you'll be paid one lump sum for the, the, the package, which includes Thursday evening and Shabbos. That would be legitimate. The problem is that they have to present their hours to the government, uh, to whichever government body it is, and they have to there stipulate which the hours were. And it's going to be uh, unwise to start fiddling around with that. It's uh, and Perhaps, perhaps incorrect. So this, this is really the dilemma. How are you going to get around that? Um, I'm a little bit, um, the only thing that I'm thinking of is if the Jewish employer, who is like the middleman, pays them in a kosher way, the fact that they have to present hours to the government, but they're not earning the money from the government, they're being paid by the middleman, that may be one way Around it because really it is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. Well, we have here a heter, a shame mitzvah, and it is a, a very important thing which we would li love to find a permissible way to that it should happen. Okay, let's move on. So I was uh, at a Hachnosa Sefer Torah 
in Manchester just over a month ago, I think, and I noticed that there was a sticker on the outside of the parchment, which had possibly uh, some identification, uh, telephone number, whatever, a contact. And I asked them to remove it before, you know, as they were finishing Sepatoya, before, uh, so that's, that, that, that's, that was, I was a bit anxious about it. So really, this goes back to 50, 60 years ago, there was this concern that masuzas were being checked, Baruch Hashem, possibly got to do with the Rebbe's uh, mezuzah. Till then, it was Mamish, uh, a lot of not kosher masuzas in the market. And the Rebbe, part of the Rebbe's campaign inc <laughs> included that there was a, a uh, law in the Israeli um, in the parliament that to forbid the sale of postle masuzas. And I remember the Rebbe talking about there was a there was a uh, a parliament uh, a parliamentarian who was totally not religious, but she was very outspoken that the you're not allowed to sell fraud mezuzahs. Whether you whether I'm religious or not is one thing, but you're not allowed to sell fraud mezuzahs. So Baruch Hashem, there was a big uh, revival in the in in the uh, checking of mezuzahs, etc. So then when you buy a mezuzah, you should need to have a certificate that has been checked by, uh, by someone competent. So then could you have some kind of um, embossed seal on the mezuzah that has been checked? And so Reb Moshe Feinstein says, no, you're not allowed to have it. Never that, certainly not to have added writing. You may recall that in the Rambam, he talks about where people were writing names of malochim inside the mezuzah. And the Rambam really lashes out at this. He says, you're taking a mitzvah and making it into an amulet. And because you're putting extra writing, you are disqualifying the mezuzah. The mezuzah must only have the two parishes of Shema and Vahoyim Shemoya. So additional writing in the mezuzah isn't okay. Even, says Reb Moshe Feinstein, even an embossed let, um, a word, muga, which means check, that also wouldn't be okay because you're adding to the script. You've got on the back of the mezuzah, you've got Hashem's name, she and Dal Then we've got also on the back of Hashem, Hashem, we've got those mezuzah writing, whatever, without going to detail. But other than that, there shouldn't be any extra, extra writing. Is a sticker the same as writing in the mezuzah? My feeling is it is, because what's the difference whether the ink is stuck directly or the ink is on a piece of paper and the piece of paper is stuck? It becomes still part of the mezuzah, and therefore I think it's a problem. And what I've got here, I'll see in the chat in a moment, but I'll, um, what I've got here on the screen from a, I just did a search on the, so the Sefer Mishnah Sastam, a contemporary Sefer, that one should not be imprinting on a Sefer Torah or mezuzah, the words Nivdak, which means it's been checked, or anything else, even on the outside. And even if it's just um, embossed or engraved, and, and so I would say the same thing as with a, with a, uh, with a, ah, uh, so Reb Arya is asking, what about invisible ink code? All right, that's, that's might be, I'm, I'm sure it's been discussed because the other side of it is we do want to have a form of, a way of identifying a sepatera to avoid, you know, to prevent it from theft. It should be able to, yes, there was the question of putting uh, an identifying feature which would only be visible with ultraviolet light. Possibly, possibly. I mean, I'm sure it's been discussed in contemporary forum because and the, 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 the redeeming factor is it's not legible. It's only, it's only legible. It's not, it's not, not visible. It's only visible under with a special equipment. So you can say that's not considered additional writing. That is an argument, yeah. But I, I don't want to say something definitive. Generally, matters of sophros is a very specialized area. And I try to uh, steer clear of saying anything, which I don't feel totally qualified to, uh, to say. Okay, let's go on. So last year, we went through this. Um, perhaps we'll go through it briefly. What happened last, what happened in Tofshin Memhei, so 
that year Tisha B'Av was on a Shabbos, and therefore the fast was on Sunday. And Rabbi Yomi Klein, the Rebbe Gabe, one of the Rebbe Gaboim, he had yurt site on Yud Av. And during the Shachris, the Rebbe was downstairs for Shachris, or well, downstairs, upstairs, I'm not sure I wasn't there. Um, the Rebbe is present at Shachris, and when it came to after Moedim, before Sim Sholem, the Rebbe would always turn towards the Chazan to see the Chazan by Yavarechacho, and Chabad is quite em emphasized to the right and to the left, etc. And the Rebbe would be knowing um, to look very intently at the Chazan at, the, at that moment of what the Chazan says, Birchas Koenim. So he turned towards the Chazan to say, for the Birchas Koenim. Now, in Kitzvah Shifanach, etc., uh, it says the meaning is not to do Birchas Koenim on Shachris of, of Tisha B'Av. And so that's, that was one thing. So in the evening, well, later in the day, Rabbi Grona wrote to the Rebbe to query whether this was a heroas, whether this was a, 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 a ruling to continue this way, or was it what's called a heroas sure, it's only a one-off uh, ruling. The second point was about the drinking of the wine of Havdola, where the, where whether it should whether this was because bear in mind it was already the night of the tenth of all after the tenth of all is there an objection to the to the man making of dollar to drink the wine when there is a child available so for the for the first question the Rebbe did confirm that his was a hero show but then he writes two things that you look at the Kafachayim and you'll see that uh, he writes that despite there is the Minig not to do Bechas Koyanim at the morning of, of Tisha B'Av, but the Minig of the Mekobolim, there was a, there's a community, was a community called Beis Kelia Kabitz, and he said that Minig of that community, which follow Kabbalah, they do Bechas Koenim at Shachris on Tisha B'av also because the Kavonas for Shachris are the same on Tisha B'av as the whole year round. So that's one thing which the Rebbe is referring to. And the other thing is to Rebbe Amram Goen, going back some 1100 years ago, who writes that on Tisha B'av morning and afternoon, Bechas Koenim is done. And for Oid, I didn't find anything else, I mean, did not look too hard, but the Rebbe is, is, is showing that there are strong sources for saying Bechas Koenim in the morning of Tisha B'Av. Um, what I'm finding puzzling is the Rebbe that said it's a Hiroas Shor. Does that mean uh, that we do follow it, we don't follow it? I don't know. Um, you have this idea when the Rebbe has a, a Yesh Lema, it becomes by Chos, it becomes a Dova Borer, but he says it's a Hiroas Shor, so I don't know how you, how you handle that. The second one was, about the the cup of Havdalah, so the wine. So he gives a reference to the El Yarabo, um, who who says, as far as I remember, not to drink the wine. And then he gives a reference to the Luach of Rav Tukachinsky, which I did not manage to locate, uh, where he says that's Chen Mashma Chen Mepur, not to, that you shouldn't drink the wine. And that's the impression which we get from all the commentators on the Shulchan Aruch. The only one who says you can drink the wine is the Lord of Yehud in Dogam Marvavo. And he says, because it doesn't say clearly that you mustn't drink the wine. But the Pashtas, it says in Simitov Kofnun Aleph, not to drink uh, the wine, wine during the nine days. Uh, and so therefore, and, and it also says that Motsi Tishabov is the same as the nine days. On the contrary, um, the distinction of the Dogam Marvavo, the Lord of Yehuda, no one mentions it. And the, the fact that it says clearly that you're not allowed to drink wine on Motze Tisha B'Av, it said clearly in Shukhan how it should be said, but for your wife, for how dull it is, okay. So the Rebbe basically takes the view that it, would, that it wasn't okay to drink the wine and uh, it should have been given to a child. Now again, here, the Rebbe says, So what does that mean? Where does that leave us? Do we follow this, or do we say we can rely on the dog of Mervovo that you can drink the wine? So, the, 
I'm, my, my inclination is more to take this uh, as Hero Islamizer, even though the Rebbe had said it's only Hero show. Right, let's move on. So, so we had a discussion, was it last week or two weeks ago, about the area of payas. So several people asked me to clarify, in addition to the area of the payas, the thickness of the payas. And so let's first, let's go with, uh, perhaps to the next slide, how generally chassidim were particular that it shouldn't have very short, that the payas, that the payas of the head should not be trimmed very, very short. What I did mention last week, is that when the Rebbe had a haircut, we did not see that the payas were thicker. But he didn't have a very close number. What we're seeing now is people are cutting their hair very close, and the payas also become are cut very, very close. And that's something which is, uh, is not a happy uh, development from a chsidish angle. So here we have two little stories. One is from the Sefer, so talking about Ramosha Vyshetsky. So Yermesha Vyshetsky was a very, very chassidish yid. He, he lived in, 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 uh, in, where was it? Chernovitz, wherever it was, Samarkand. It was very important for his chinuch of his children. When I mean, he'd give them a haircut, he would give them a chassidish haircut and leave, they leave them big, big pace. This is in communist Russia. One time, uh, one of the children said to his father, he's worried that his payas, if they're too uh, conspicuous, so he'll get trouble when he walks in the street. So his father says to him, if people won't know, notice that you have payas, then that means you don't have payas. So it was a very important thing in communist Russia that his children should have noticeable payas. Okay. The other quote here is from Reb Meir Gurkov, who used to live in London until Tovshin Lamed Hay when he passed away. And he's describing, this is his memoirs. He's talking about the children, the Tamimim, et cetera, how they would be very noticeable um, how they would dress, you know, in a refined way, and your Shemai and the Tzitzis were all visible, and they always had their hair cut, their head covered, even in the very hot days, they would be wearing a yarmulke, a makif, what we used to call it in Russia, and not like the other young kids who would be, there would be chutzpah and uh, wildness, etc., and that would be also visible in their clothing, and they would go bareheaded, and sometimes half undressed, and he says the Tamimim would be visible also on their faces, their edel appearance, your Shemaim on their faces, and it was also visible their long payas, which would go down to their cheeks, which is quite interesting. He's saying that, uh, that he's describing life back in Russia in the Shtetlach and how they had uh, visible payas, and he says also they would be down to their cheeks, which I find interesting. Um, all right, so that's that's on the certainly on the historical uh, um, level that we did always make a point of that the, the payas should be um, shouldn't be too too close should be uh, should be visible etc. Okay, now here what you have on this screen is from a sefer called Haksava Kabola. It's not uh, a not a not a chiddush sefer. Well, he's, he's, and it's in Parshas Gdoshim. He's looking at And he's very interesting. What is exactly um, the Pa'as Hazokon? Is it, is it the face or is it the hair? And he makes an interesting observation. It does not say you shouldn't destroy the hair. It says you shouldn't deface, so to speak, the, the chin. The head. That's what he's saying. He's saying that it really the payo and the zokon refers to that part of the body where the hair grows. Now, elsewhere we have a halacha about hair. For example, by poradumo uh, about the hair, and then we have a din of it shouldn't be any other colored hair other than red. Then we have in the case of mitsoiro, we have a din of hair being a symptom of tumor, etc. In those places, we have a halacha that if it is long enough that you can bend back the top back to the to the source. Okay, that's the expression here. of Russian ikron. So he's saying that that is said where the Torah talks about seor, talks about hair. Then there's a minimum size 
which is called seor. And if it's shorter than that, it doesn't count as hair. He's actually, he's coming from a different angle to our discussion. He's asking what happens if a person has got the very short hair and then they take a razor and they've got payers, which are already very short. And so short, you couldn't bend it back. And then he takes a razor and removes it totally. Is he punishable for removing his payers? So he says he is because there's no minimum length by payers. So yeah, when it's got to do with the mitzayra, et cetera, there's a minimum short length. If it's shorter than that, it doesn't count as a hair. Therefore, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't it's not a sympathy of tumma, et etc. et cetera. But here, there's no din of, it doesn't say the word sayer. And therefore, even a very short hair, if you destroy it totally, so then you're in violation of destroying the payas. But the, the how do you say, the, oh, the spin-off of that is that there's no minimum length of the payer. That's, that's what it is. He's, although he's, he's addressing a more a humra stance, but there's a, there's a spin-off of which is the kula. So that may be, um, but as I say, the, certainly the minig is to have that the payas should be that little bit longer and should be visible, and certainly uh, to have a very short haircut in a way that leaving mamish uh, a couple of millimeters long, it, it would not be okay. Let's move on. Right, now, I think we had this discussion not too long ago um, about if you have a minion and they don't have, uh, on so fast day, they don't have a minion of people are fasting. So someone sent to me from Reb Zalman Shimon's writing. Reb Zalman Shimon's work was Robinson 70. And there's a book, a safer called Kovitz Razash. And there he has a letter of Reb Zalman Shimon to someone called Spaceman. And I've never heard of this Spaceman as part of the Chabad community, uh, other than his mention over there. Uh, it could be one of the people Reb Zalman Shimon knew back from Pittsburgh before he moved back to Crown Heights. Um, but he writes the following. Um, you should know the minig is, he's quoting now, he, what he's quoting here, be careful, is from a sefer called Leket Yosher. Leket Yosher is a, it's written by a Talmud of Rabbi Yisrael Isselin. Yisrael Isselin is famous for his sefer called Trumas Hadeshen. He was a, a generation or two before Rabbi Yosef Karo. Don't know exactly the, the history of that in that approximate period. Um, one of the Mamish, the Gedele Hadoy, and he has a Talmud who follows his his uh, practices, and you know, you know he's like like in, like a Hasid to Rebbe. Rebbe did this, Rebbe did that. So that's what Leket Yosha is. But there he writes the following: Minig is you look to, if there's ten people who are ready to fast. This is like a voluntary fast, and if you don't find ten, you look for seven, and if not, at least you have three to fasting, and then you can say our name. So here you see that you can have three, it's enough to say Aneinu. Now, so this is not such a big surprise because the Tzermach Tzedek, as you see over here, quotes also the Sefer Ho Agudo, who is also a uh, Yakish Hoysuk, who also says that you can have, if you have three people who are fasting, you can say Aneinu. However, the Shukhan Aruch asks, like the Rashbo, who says you cannot, that three people fasting is not enough to say Aneinu. You have to have a minion who are fasting to say Anenu. Now, just running through this briefly, because I think we have gone through this before. This is in the time there was a chaleria, there was a, an a, a epidemic of some sort. And the Tzimach Tzedek here in one place says, you can rely on the Aguda. If you have three people are fasting, then you can say Anenu with a separate bracha as it's discussed elsewhere, as I've written about this elsewhere. Well, elsewhere, the Tzimach Tzedek goes into this in more detail, and he says that Korea, that um, there is one who says even a Yochid, but if you have at least, you have three people, and then he says you've got another seven who have eaten Pochus Mikashir, then you could say Anein. Um, and here we have again, another writing of Tzimach Tzedek, if there are three who are fasting, and for sure there'll be another seven who have eaten Pochus Mikashir, then you can say Anein. So what I'm seeing here is that Tzimach Tzedek is not saying you don't need uh, more than three. He's saying you've got three who are fasting authentically, 
And the other seven would like to fast, but they can't fast properly. So they're eating a little bit because of the plague. They don't want to weaken their, uh, their immunity. So they, but uh, to, 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 if people are eating without any regard for the fast, I think that is a problem to see our Neno with their presence, um, you know, with their making up morning. Oh. The uh, alternative is, as I said last time, say Aneinu in Shemeat Filo, uh, incorporated in Shemeat Filo, no question of Baruchel of Atola then, and that solves your problem. Okay, let's move on. We almost finished our list of questions for today, but someone asked me to clarify, are you allowed to bake and cook on Tisha B'Av afternoon for Shabbos? So Tisha B'Av one avoids doing malacha, but the afternoon is more lenient. That's written already because the Shekhanaruch and Shekhanaruch. The afternoon is permitted. You'll have to start preparing food for the evening. But I wanted to get something more, more poem clear. So this is from the Nietzsche Gabriel. And he writes, when Tisha B'Av is on a Thursday, then you're allowed to bake and cook on even before Chatzais, the covered Shabbos, so certainly in the afternoon, you'd be allowed to do um, cooking and, and baking for Shabbos. The afternoon would be okay. Um, so that's a clear a clear uh, ruling on that. He says here, which also is an interesting thing, if you need clothes for Shabbos and you have a non-Jewish worker, so you could ask them to do the, some laundry for needed, which is needed for Shabbos, you'd be allowed to ask them to do uh, uh, if it's not possible to manage to do that on Friday for whatever reason. Uh, then he talks about person traveling, which, okay, we'll have to deal with that separately. Right, let's go on for our last thing. And that was, as I was in the, um, in the, my, my, my slot in the base hero here in Stamford Hill is on Friday morning. I'm there from, 11.30 to 1, uh, I asked for that slot because I hope that Friday would be a more busy slot. So before going to this, Mendel is asking about would the same limitations apply to Vayichal? And the answer is no. Vayichal is actually more lenient than Aneinu because the people who are having the aliyahs, they are fasting and they're making a bracha on their aliyah. So for Vayichal, You've got three people fasting, and they are given the alias. That's that that works. Uh, for Aneinu, it's a bracha said by the chazan because there's a tzibur which are fasting, and that's where it becomes more uh, difficult. And therefore, if you don't have ten people fasting, uh, then you should just say Aneinu in in Shemayat and then you finish off Baruch Atah Hashem by Inulam Yisroel Eisora VeShemayat Right, let's move on. The, this is our last thing on our list for today. So someone's asking, people are now going on holidays, and so sometimes you need to make an aid of, if you're sharing premises with others. She's asking, can you make an aid of with a mezainas roll? So at first I didn't feel it's a problem. Actually, the aid of has to be made with bread, but it can be even bread, which is um, rice bread. It doesn't have to be hamotzi bread. It can be an, another type of bread. And then here, this is so this is the Orocha Shulchan. It says it can be bread which is hamotzi, or even bread which is mezoinus. He quotes from the Dark Moshe in the name of Rabbeinu Yerucham that you can use lachman yos, um, which is really mezoinus as you look in some Kuf Samaches, and still you can use that. My only dilemma is for mezoinus to become hamoitzi, you need to have a larger amount. So the minimum amount for Eru is that each family has to be represented by a uh, the size of a, um, a gregris, size of a fig, whatever whatever it is. Do, if you're using mezoinus, would that be enough? Or do you have to have a larger amount? Because a smaller amount is not considered bread, only when it becomes a large amount. So I don't know the answer. The fellow called me again on Friday. I told him, just use just use Hamoiti spread, you know, use your Hamoiti chala and finish and avoid the problem. But it's an interesting question. I wanted to share that with you. Um, 
Well, you know what? I'm going to share with you one more thing which came in on Friday. So a woman asks me, she uh, listens to a lot of shiurim and she's got three toddlers and sometimes she's got these earbuds when she's listening to shiurim. Is she allowed to listen, to continue listening to something a shiur online whilst she's changing the baby's diapers? So I answered her actually that it is okay because you are allowed to think Torah in the presence of uh, of something which is offensive. To say words of Torah wouldn't be okay, but since it's just a machshava, then the what's going on in machshava is 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 not exposed to the offensive matter, and therefore that would be okay. Well, we'll start with that and wish you all a uh, good evening. And if you wish you wish you the simcha, we shouldn't have to fast. And we should see the Ola uh, Hashlema. And these days will be days of Sosan or Simcha or Mayadim Tevim. Thank you for joining us, and I wish you all good night.